the challenge of the Yukon. King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region. And the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. Men who went to the Yukon from the States left from San Francisco or Seattle. And it was in Seattle, in the brokerage offices of Edward J. Burns, that Bob Mitchell met the turn of circumstance that eventually led him to the Alaskan frontier. Late afternoon, Sam Harris, an elderly, dignified clerk, walked toward him, a hurt and baffled expression on the old man's face. Why, Sam, what's wrong? You look as if you'd lost your only friend. I, I just had a terrible shock. Hey, wait a minute. Here, sit down. Oh, thank you. Is there anything I can do? Can I get anything for no, you? No, 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 there's nothing. Unless you have $15,000. Fifteen thousand? I don't understand. My wife... The shock will kill her. What is it, Sam? What's this all about? I've just been talking to Mr. Burns. Yes? There's $15,000 missing. Mr. Burns says I... I stole it to buy this stock in some mine in Alaska. But... Lady Luck Mine? Where'd this come from? I never saw it before. Until Mr. Burns had the office boy bring in my coat. It was in my breast pocket. He's giving me until tomorrow noon to produce the money. If I, if I don't, I... <laughs> it can't be. No, no, don't take it so hard, Sam. If I don't produce that fifteen thousand dollars, he'll turn me over to the police. I tell you, I didn't steal the money. They'll send me to the penitentiary. <laughs> it was shortly after nine o'clock that night. Bob restlessly paced the floor in the drawing room of the Burns home as a young, attractive girl spoke honestly. Bob, I didn't say I won't marry you. It's only, only that... Only what? Oh, look, Polly, I love you. I've told you that how many times? I don't have much money, but we could get along. If you loved me, you'd marry me. We'd put it off long enough. It's only because of Uncle Walter. You know how he feels about it. Your Uncle Walter's running your father's business. I guess he wants to run your life, too. If we're up to him, we'd never get married, and you know. Oh, no, that's not fair. He doesn't... Fair? Mean... Is he being fair to us? I'll tell you what he wants you to do. He wants you to forget all about me. He wants you to marry that trotter guy so he can use his millions to pull the business out of the rut. Well, I've been a clerk in the Burns Company long enough to see... Bob? Bob, what is it? You look as if... It's nothing, Polly. I'll ask you once more. Will you marry me? You know I love you, but... I can't marry you without Uncle Walter's consent. All right. So that's the way it is. Wait, where are you going? Your uncle wants you to marry a man with money. And there's only one way I know of to get it. Wait, please. Goodbye, Polly. It was three months later, and in the crowd of men who swarmed into Skagway, Bob Mitchell was a bewildered but determined Chicago. Two more drinks, Red. You'll have another one with me, won't you, Mr. Uh... Mitchell? Bob Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You say you're heading for Cottonwood Creek? Uh-huh. Got uh, something lined up there? I'm looking for the Lady Luck Mine, if that means anything to you. Say, now, that's interesting. Maybe you and me could uh, get together on a deal. Meanwhile, back in Seattle, Polly Burns stood at her uncle's bedside. Listen, Polly. Dr. Simpson can't fool me. I'm going to die, and I know it. I want to clear something up before I go. Get it off my conscience. Get what off your conscience? When Bob Mitchell left, you remember, there was a scandal. But he didn't take that money, Uncle Walter. I know he didn't. 
I've never been able to understand. I'm telling you now what happened. He came to me that night. It was the same day I told Sam Harris about the disappearance of the money. There's a look in a man's eyes when he's got something on his mind. And I can see it on his face when he Sam never took that money, Mr. Burns. We both know that. Now, see here, Mitchell. You've got no right to take a hand in this affair. It doesn't concern you. I've already discussed it with Mr. Harris. You didn't discuss anything with him. You told him. Young man, you've been with us a long time, but that gives you no authority. You're not going to fire me, Mr. Burns, because I'm leaving. Not before I make a few things clear. Well... When Polly, I mean Miss Burns' father, died three years ago, the firm was still making money. It's only been lately that business has taken a turn for the worse. Only in the last three years... If you'll intimate... I'm not intimating anything. I'm telling you that Sam did not take that money. He never took anything in his life. He can't turn the money over to you by noon tomorrow because he hasn't got it. Why, a disgrace would kill him. That's unfortunate. Wait, I'm not finished. I've already seen Sam. I've got that stock for the mine. He turned it over to me tonight. As far as you're concerned, Mr. Burns, or Sam, or anybody else, I'm the one that took the money. That's what you want, isn't it? Somebody to pin it on? He left the next day for me. He set out for the Yukon. When the scandal broke, he was out of the country. Oh, he took the blame for Harris and covered up covered up for me. I knew he didn't take it. I was so sure. That was why he left. I never said goodbye. I imagine he shielded me because of you. He had an idea, I think. But you see, child, I had to explain to you. The Yukon. I'll have to find him. I'll have to tell him I know. No, the damage is done. He's gone now. You think I... that because he's born the disgrace, it's all finished? That he can go up to that, that Yukon and stay there? Well, it isn't so. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to find him. It was a slow and tedious journey for Polly Burns from Seattle to the gateway of the Yukon. Three long months, and finally, Skagway, only to be overwhelmed suddenly by the realization that she was still almost a world apart from the man she sought. Sergeant Preston, they've told me that you're the only man who can help. Well, I'd say you've set quite a task for yourself from what you've just said, ma'am. But King and I will do everything we can to find Bob Mitchell for you. I never knew how big the Yukon is or how unsettled. Somehow I thought it would be easy to find him once I got here. He is innocent, Sergeant. I have a paper signed by my uncle to prove it. Hmm. From what you told me about him, I judge that he was pretty much a tenderfoot when he got here. What's that? Well, I mean by that that he didn't know what he was in for. I don't think he did. Well, I'd suggest you stay here in town, for a while at least. I can't promise you anything, but we'll look around until we find something definite to go on. I'll never be able to thank you, Sergeant. All right, King. Come on, fella. Well, I'd say we've got a big job on our hands. You think so, too, huh, fella? Well, I've seen young people very much in love, and that girl's had a lot of trouble. Yes, a lot of trouble. And I'll wager the only thing that's driven her on is the love she has for this Mitchell fellow. She's got a lot of courage, King. And that's what we need up here. Courage and strong, honest young people to build homes and communities in a wilderness. Hi there, Sergeant. Hello, Clem. I wonder if you can give me some information. Well, if I can, I will. In the last six or eight months, do you remember meeting a tall, blonde young fellow named Mitchell, Bob Mitchell? Shucks, that's a long time back. <laughs> and let me see. Uh... No, can't say as I remember the name. Hey, I remember a fellow named Mitchell. Young, fair-haired. Greener than anything ever got off a boat. Seems to me like he was bound for Cottonwood Creek, Sergeant. That was a long time ago. Yeah, he come to Cottonwood Creek, Sergeant. How long ago, Dan? About five months, seems like. The reason I remember him is because he went around asking people about the Lady Luck Mine. Mike McGavin was traveling with him, going along for a guide. <laughs> Much good he'd be. Bob Mitchell awakened with a start. He crawled out of his sleeping bag and stretched lazily. Suddenly, his eyes widened. 
Mike. Mike. That's funny. The sign of Mike or the dog. Gone. The sled and the dogs. Figure this out. Tracks. He must have left two hours ago. Jumping Jupiter. He pulled out and... And here I am without dogs or a sled. It was several hours later that King led Sergeant Preston to where Mitchell stood beside the windswept bank of a creek not far from his camp. <laughs> King and I have been looking for you for a long time, Bob. He's the most intelligent animal I've ever seen. You say McGavern pulled out this morning. Yeah, and this is why he pulled out. Look, see in this gravel. See, the wind swept the snow clear. Gold. Flakes of placer gold. I'd have told you about it when you first rode in. Doesn't seem so exciting now that I know McGavin's beating me to it. <laughs> He'll be in a recorder's office by sundown. You heard that, fella? Well, we'll have to get there before sundown. Get the dogs up, boy. What are you going to do? Get in my sled, Bob. Hey, now, wait a minute, Sergeant. You're not going to try getting to town now, are you? Well, there's not a chance in a thousand. You've never traveled with King in the lead. Get in and don't waste time arguing. All right, if you say so. Hun King! Hun you Hun King! Look at that dog travel. He sure sets a fast pace. Or maybe we might get to Fort Munn in time. There's only one thing I don't understand. Yes? You said you've been looking for me. You, uh, you didn't put me under arrest. Well, that wasn't my reason for following you. Well, then, what was your reason? When we get to Fort Munn, I think you'll understand everything. I'm going to cut across the river here to avoid the trail through the pass, which is probably the way McGavern will go. It was a full hour before sundown when the great dog King led Sergeant Preston's huskies into Fort Munn. With the air of a man who could hardly believe his good fortune, Bob Mitchell made his way to the recorder's office, while Sergeant Preston and King went on another errand. Polly Burns came forward to meet the Mountie. Any luck this time, Sergeant? I suppose now we've got another clue that'll take us to some other small settlement. It... What is it? He looks so, so mysterious. Mysterious? Why, I'm just pleased. King here has just outdone himself. Made a run in record time. King, he's trying to tell me something. Sergeant Preston, you, you're keeping something from me. Hmm. If I'm not mistaken, there's Mike McGavern just pulling in town. Yes, that's who it is. <laughs> well, he's in for a big disappointment. You're, you're just evading my question. Please. You're right, Miss Burns. I was evading your question. But King here doesn't want to keep the secret. You recognize that man coming down the street? I thought it would be better for you to see for yourself. Polly! Polly! Polly, how did you... Bob! He found you! Sergeant Preston found you. Oh, darling. I didn't know. Oh, Polly. Sergeant, why didn't you tell me? I tried so hard to get in touch with you. Uncle Walter told me how you took the blame for everything. And as for that gold but mine... But, honey, I did find gold. Wait till I tell you about it. Not the mine I was looking for, but it sure looks good to me. I'm calling it the Lady Luck Claim. Might not have Trotter's millions in it, but I'm rich enough to ask you to marry me. Sergeant, we owe you so much. King and I are mighty glad to see you together. We wish you a lot of happiness, don't we, boy? <laughs> and now, King, it looks like this job is finished. <laughs> Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you each week at this time, originated in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. This is Jack McCarthy speaking. This is the